forward. Thank you. Okay. So um, just a, a reiteration of the warm welcome for the sake of the recording. Welcome to our session. Um, today, uh, we'll be discussing financing solutions, ecosystems for social enterprises that work. And we have uh, an opportunity to, to really delve into a subject matter that is uh, near and dear to our hearts at Artha Networks. And it's a, a true pleasure to be able to collaborate in the context of the incredible Catalyst 2030 network. Um, I'm gonna start by setting the frame for a brief um, few moments. And the structure for today's conversation will be uh, kind of six to seven minute um, presentations from each of our speakers who will present themselves, introduce themselves in their background. And we will follow up uh, that round of uh, presentations and discussions with uh, an active, highly interactive Q&A. So really excited about this today. And I'll start with the following. Access to finance uh, remains one of the biggest challenges for social enterprises. And of course, we are all familiar with at least uh, one success story of an amazing social entrepreneur securing the financing they require to drive positive impact. But these success stories are more often the exception than the rule. And so as a community of practitioners, how can improved access to finance become more systemic? What does that ecosystem look like and how can it be achieved? Uh, we, need answer, we need to answer these questions if we are to achieve the SDGs by 2030, as we know, and they are, there are substantial shortfalls in the size, of, uh, the size of the active market. I'm just admitting in, sorry, I had about 10 more people in the waiting room. So just admitting in another crowd. Um, Wonderful. Um, I would propose that the key characteristics of a robust ecosystem for financing solutions include greater visibility on appropriate financing models, variety and diversity, space for competition and transparency on fundamental information versus proprietary information, all resulting in more financing flowing more quickly to more social entrepreneurs. As new forms of finance are emerging, visibility on new models and providing the conditions uh, for flourishing is a key priority for Catalyst 2030 and its purpose and mission. So in what is an unquestionably well-intentioned but highly fragmented ecosystem, an operating hypothesis held by many is that tech tools and platforms are an important part of enabling our collaboration and better efficiency and ultimately better outcomes for entrepreneurs. It's our collective goal. It's, it's also on, on some level why, you know, the, the, the raison d'etre for most of our networks. Technology plays an important role, notably in facilitating the continued exchanges often kickstarted by wider networks and their associated events, workshops, clubs, and so on. So this conversation today brings together key conveners, platform operators, um, platform developers like ourselves, including private sector associations and foundations that are using technology to advance their support to social entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs um, that, you know, so that we can delve into the nuts and bolts of what's needed, where and why. So we will explore a few concrete examples uh, of such work and reflect as well on what has been learned through COVID vis-a-vis -vis the push to digitizing and digitization and collaborative remote workflows that we've all had to master. The inexorable push to technology is an imperative for some, not an option. And so our goal here is to determine what key components drivers and opportunities can inform Catalyst's own co-creation process as we figure out how best to serve the financing needs of Catalyst marketplace investors and entrepreneurs. And so we'd like to begin today with um, uh, Topher and Anita in particular uh, to share a little bit about their macro point of view as 
you know, th those involved in convening and major co coordination efforts and, 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 and those active in uh, advisory support. And we will then continue uh, to ask uh, Victoria Crawford and Kwang Kim to uh, share a little bit about their respective examples and share their key takeaways and elements of their experiences in operating these platforms dedicated to specific, very niche pipelines. And then we will hear from Ajaita Shah, who's a social entrepreneur whose business has been funded in many rounds and phases uh, through various uh, collaborative investor constellations. So um, very happy to be with you all today. And without further ado, um, over to Topher, uh, who is CEO of Opportunity Collaboration and founder of conveners.org. Thank you, Audrey. Um, hello, everybody. Greetings from uh, a rising dawn here in uh, west coast of the United States in Santa Cruz, California. Um, pleasure to be here with you all. Um, this idea of co-creating ecosystems for social enterprises has been top of mind for me for well over a decade now, um, specifically related to my work with Opportunity Collaboration and also conveners.org, as Audrey said. Um, for those of you who are not aware, Opportunity Collaboration is normally uh, a one uh, annual in-person event that we would curate uh, every October. We bring together about 400 plus social enterprise leaders, nonprofit leaders, uh, philanthropic leaders, people from the impact investing field, uh, corporate folks, media folks, academics, et cetera, et cetera, um, all, al all aligned around this common theme of solutions to poverty. How do we build more sustainable solutions to poverty? And of course, that, uh, that word sustainable um, can easily connote uh, you know, a more effective flow of, of capital and various other resources uh, to the folks doing the work on the ground. Uh, in other words, opportunity collaboration is in essence a, a mechanism through which uh, the right people find the right resources at the right time to scale up their important work, impact work. Um, we've, we've built that engine around the power of in-person events over the years. Um, our model is very uh, different than a standard conference. It's this unconference approach. Uh, we're trying to facilitate authentic human connections at the at the outset of all the interactions that happen in OC. So it's, it's less about the sort of rapid flinging of business cards around the room and the, uh, the <laughs> two minute elevator pitch and more about how do we get to build that foundation of trust and, and empathy with each other first and foremost. Um, how do we ensure that we, we truly align around our, our values and the work that we're all doing internally in this world um, before we launch into uh, the, the professional work, but the theory being that if we're successful at building that foundation of trust, we can be so much more effective at building lasting, effective partnerships and collaborations. Um, opportunity collaboration, as many probably, uh, have experienced themselves have made the prerequisite pivot to virtual with the global pandemic. Um, so last year we launched what we call OC 365, which is a series of monthly online touch points, mainly via zoom. Uh, where we convene the network on uh, an ongoing basis. And we tried our best to replicate the unconference approach with those virtual uh, interactions. So a lot of breakouts, a lot of small group conversations, um, everyone's participating, uh, camera on, mute button off. Um, you know, it says, essentially, how do we continue to weave that, that network effect by getting folks in conversation and dialogue with each other at any given turn? Um, this year, knock on all the wood, we have the return of the in-person event for the first time in several years. The last one was 2019. Yeah, Anita, um, I'll see you there. Uh, and, and we are weaving that together with these virtual touch points. So starting in January this year, all the way through September, we've got monthly touch points with the community and then that community convenes in person or in real life IRL uh, in September, the Dominican Republic this year. So this notion of uh, online convening and digital technology to drive uh, this ecosystem for social change is very top of mind for me these days um, in, in the context of OC. Uh, from a platform perspective, I should be clear about that so everyone knows the, the, the level playing field here. 
Um, we've used what we call pathable over the years as our delegate roster and our agenda. Um, but ironically, and this is why I'm excited so, uh, to see where this conversation takes us, we've never had um, active, we've never promoted active engagement in that online platform. In other words, it's very sort of static list of the folks who attend. And then we curate those connections um, as conveners ourselves. In other words, we're weaving the network effect together um, proactively and personally in a very high touch way, um, which is of course a lot of work and highly inefficient <laughs> in some level. So I'm eager to see where uh, a platform like this that we're discussing could actually add a lot of feel to the existing spirit of collaboration in OC. Um, outside of OC, I also am the co-founder of an organization called convenors.org. Uh, and this came uh, largely out of recognition that a lot of these impact networks, especially these, these one-time annual events, uh, we're providing ways for everyone else to get together in this impact ecosystem of ours um, as a way to ensure that we're reducing redundancy, um, you know, maximizing efficiency, uh, making sure that there is an uh, open exchange of ideas and resources and best practices, uh, partnerships are flourishing at our respective events, and yet these events and the event organizers were operating in their own silos. So we were, you know, in very thick irony, not talking to each other at the same time that we were espousing everyone else to talk to each other. Um, so communities.org was born to solve for that irony and create a space where a lot of these major impact conference organizers and network builders um, had a place to talk to each other, to build partnerships and collaborations, share ideas, best practices, et cetera. Um, the flip side of solving for that irony was this vision of, um, you know, my, my gosh, if these network uh, builders, these, these sort of field makers in this impact ecosystem, if we were truly successful at finding better ways to work together and in greater, greater coordination and greater collaboration, imagine uh, you know, the acceleration effect that that could provide to the ecosystem. Um, so convenors.org related to this conversation has often uh, been at the table around um, various platforms to connect these various networks. Um, we've, we've gone down that road before, we've seen attempts in the past. Um, and I think, I think, I hope here that with the global pandemic and the uh, the sort of uh, the requirement for all of us to get more adept and used to the idea of working online together um, could actually be the, the spark that we needed to ensure that these platforms that we've seen uh, rise and fall in years past actually take root uh, and actually realize the potential that I think we all feel is, is here. Um, so I'm really in service of this conversation as uh, someone who's been uh, privileged enough to sort of see a lot of the uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the 30,000 foot view of both the individual trees, but also the, the all the various forests uh, in this global ecosystem of impact. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you, you all. Um, Audrey, I don't know if you wanted me to say anything else, but I'll, I'll so for, I did actually want to, when we spoke the other day, um, you, you did kind of have a, a comment about how the physical meets the virtual um, mm -hmm. and thinking about managing hybrid. Um, mm -hmm. Anything, any thoughts to share on that topic? Yeah, well, so as I shared, I mean, this is the, this is really the first year that OC is experimenting with this combination. Um, it's, it's a little bit different than a lot of the other impact convenings that I know of uh, as they're approaching a hybrid reality here. Um, so many of the uh, impact conveners I know of are essentially, as they're seeing the return of in-person uh, events, offering both a online way to participate and a uh, in-person way to participate in the same event, in the same time-bound experience. Um, OC, on the other hand, is taking a little bit of a different tack. So we have these monthly touch points that are all online, and then we have the in-person event, and those two are very separate, distinct uh, experiences. In other words, there will be um, no online portion of, uh, of the opportunity collaboration during the in-person event. It will solely be about okay. human to human interaction. Uh, but in general, Audrey, I think, um, I think as, I, as I said, I, I'm very excited about uh, what seems to be coalescing here in the ecosystem writ large, which is a sort of a forcing factor for all of us to step into that hybrid way of interacting. Indeed.
Thank you very much, uh, Topher, for sharing your reflections. Um, I'm going to shift gears over to you, Anita. Um, Anita Ramachandran, Executive Director, Micro Mentor at Mercy Corps. Uh, few people will know as much as you do, Anita, about the nuances and needs of social entrepreneurs as they ready themselves for present for prime time, right? And um, I know that Micro Mentor is one of, is the world's largest online community of entrepreneurs and volunteer business mentors. How do you see the role of technology in both surfacing the need for assistance and support, but also yielding the results these enterprises require by way of access to capital? Thank you, Audrey. And uh, it's great to be part of this conversation. Um, I, I have to say that a, a lot of the connections that were made uh, here for me to be here were because of OC and uh, Topher's sort of uh, convening uh, prowess. So uh, connecting you know, at OC was really um, that human connection made a, made a big difference and sort of pulled me through the last two years of uh, COVID and having to stay on Zoom. My OC community really came through. Um, it's, uh, it's really nice to be here. My name is Anita mentioned, as, uh, is, as Audrey mentioned, is Anita Ramachandran. I lead MicroMentor, which is an online community of entrepreneurs and volunteer business mentors. And this, um, this, this topic is very, uh, I think, on point in terms of how MicroMentor came about in the first place. Um, MicroMentor was uh, an idea that was seated at the Aspen Institute over a dozen years ago, primarily to democratize access to social capital um, for entrepreneurs. Now, what started as something that was rooted in, in the US is now a global community and um, our entrepreneurs come from all over the world and they it's inclusive of social entrepreneurs. The idea at that time was that fi microfinance, the fi microfinance movement was, was sort of uh, budding and rising, Grameen had picked up, but uh, research was pointing that social capital paired with financial capital was equally important um, if not even more in some cases to have entrepreneurs have the confidence, the networks, the social capital to really be able to find the resources they needed, whether it was know-how, um, skills or finance uh, to have a business mentor or somebody who can be advising and guiding them along their journey. So, and mentoring, as we know, uh, is very critical for an, an entrepreneur's journey, yet it happens in these um, you know, in silos, they, it's it's hard to scale and very costly um, to to sort of scale across uh, a community. And so, much like what you said in your in your opening, Audrey, it's the parallels are quite similar in terms of access to um, finance. You know, they they may, it's a, it's it's a complete game changer when you have it, uh, but no, but it's not assured that everybody. Um, can actually can actually have access to it, whether it's it's social capital or financial capital, it's similar. So those were the original seeds of why uh, MicroMentor was even born. Today, um, uh, we you know sort of fast forward of a, a few years. I've been with MicroMentor about ten years now. We are a social enterprise that's incubating within Mercy Corps, uh, a global NGO, and our what we have seen is. Um, Technology has played a really critical role in providing that democratized access. So entrepreneurs come on the platform, they, they sign up, they create a profile. I, I sort of often date, joke that this is a, like a dating site, you know, people come on the site, they give their information about their business and mentors are doing the same. You know, the, this marketplace, I think, is the, what's so beautiful about MicroMentor, and I'm saying this for myself, but that's what drew me to this initiative in the first place, is it taps into people's um, both capacity to give back, but they're also their desire to give back. And that became a lot more pronounced during COVID. We saw a lot more people, professionals, business people around the world who wanted to support small businesses from getting from shutting down at the rates that they were. People are, were now working from home. Um, you know, the doing things virtually just became um, a no brainer. For, for a long time, uh, I, when I would have conversations with partners, they would say, oh, well, you know, maybe in person, potentially, you know, how mentoring should be happening in person. We are, can we connect with somebody locally? And suddenly overnight that all switched. 
right? Nobody was now talking about, can we do this in person? In fact, they were like, well, how can we do this virtually? Because people can't meet in person. Um, and so we, we both were able to, I think it, it hit a moment in time when um, folks were both uh, excited about doing something virtually, wanted to support social entrepreneurs and uh, small businesses around the world. And we also saw a, a, sort of an unprecedented crisis that was affecting the world, whether it was the small businesses closing down in our own communities or social enterprises just sort of struggling to pivot and change to this new new world of you know having to go go digital. And do you, in that in that um, uh, I would say in in the nexus of all of that, what what happened was that mentorship being able to uh, be accessed virtually just sort of became a lot more accepted. Um, and so I'll step back a little bit and speak about MicroMentor. So on MicroMentor, entrepreneurs come, they create their profile. Mentors are also doing the same. They find each other, they send messages to one another. And you can, and an entrepreneur has one, maybe two, sometimes even three mentors, depending on what their needs are, the stage of business, um, what sort of, uh, you know, uh, kinds of mentorship they're looking for, whether it's like business coaching or subject matter expertise, they have the ability to really have the social capital that they might otherwise not have. You know, even for those of us here in this room, you know, we are, we have this somewhat of, you know, so our social capital itself is more than what we see around the world um, with entrepreneurs. Most of them are not having communities that they're part of like this. And, and so finding um, someone that they can speak with and share their ideas or bounce off what their challenges are or build confidence is, is something that's extremely critical. And we've seen the power of technology um, and uh, a community, most more importantly, because technology can mean so many things. And you know, I, I know technology can be very powerful, yet it can also not have, uh, you, we can't necessarily count on technology bringing about very beautiful end results, but a community um, makes, makes, a big, makes a big difference. So combining those two things of bringing the using technology and building community is something that we've seen as being really, uh, really powerful. So at MicroMentor, in addition to these one-to-one -one connections that people are able to make, we uh, have, we're more than, you know, um, entrepreneurs, mentors connecting, but that's at the heart of what MicroMentor does. What we do is we are able to partner with organizations who are able to house their own programs on the MicroMentor platform. So if, um, let's say, you know, the state of New York runs their mentorship plat program on MicroMentor's technology. So they're able to bring their communities um, and use this technology. We work with a company like Verizon, who's bringing their employees as volunteer business mentors into this micro-mentor community. So we're able to create this global network effect of various organizations that are bringing their own communities, whether it's entrepreneurs or mentors, um, into, so that, so we're once, you know, our goal is how do we create, um, break down some silos and that yeah. a global pool of mentors can be utilized by a global pool of entrepreneurs and sort of break down some of the myths around who a mentor can be. Um, I think there has been a little bit of, I've seen this around, you know, uh, happen where you'd have a program or an incubator in Africa and mentors will have to be flown in from some Western country um, where, whereas, you know, there's a, great pool of mentors that you can potentially find locally. You could find them from other parts of the world. There doesn't have to be a global South and a global North divide, um, that there is a global pool of mentors. And depending on the business owner's need, that could be a local mentor. It could be a cross-border connection that allows for that pivot or change, but it doesn't necessarily have to perpetuate some of the um, ways that we've looked at mentorship or guidance to be, you know, a CEO from a from a global north company, mentoring a social enterprise in Africa doesn't necessarily have to be the way that it works. You know, it can be really driven by the needs of the entrepreneurs and um, and what they're what they're looking for at that time in the stage of business, and that they have that marketplace to go choose from. So breaking down some of these silos, allowing for cross-border connections to happen more freely, more fluidly, 
um, and bringing in organizations so that they can house their initiatives and build into this global network network effect is something that we've um, you know we've sort of continued to grow and build micro mentor into and we we ultimately we're looking at business outcomes and job creation for these entrepreneurs and one of the things that we have found statistical significance for is um, entrepreneurs who have access to a mentor are able are far more likely to be able to connect with uh, access to finance so they have a much higher percentage of being able to connect with finance as well and we've seen that um, consistently over over the over the years that we've been doing our impact analysis um, uh, with with our mic, with our entrepreneurial community. So, uh, in in addition to the collaborative nature of this, I think there's some hard data that backs up why this is so important. Yes. How this genuinely affects the entrepreneur as well as um, they're ultimately tying it back to what you're bringing this community together for, Audrey, which is. Um, the access to finance piece. So I'll stop here and pass the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. I mean, it's amazing uh, how much energy and resource is being channeled uh, through the platform, uh, through MicroMentor, and how important that is and how it's correlated to exactly that support, that putting their best foot forward for the enterprises. So that's really interesting. Thank you very much for sharing. I'm going to switch gears um, swiftly over to, Vic to our colleague, Victoria Crawford, who is Senior Manager at Investment Partnerships at the WBCSD. And uh, Victoria, the value and exercise of, you know, you're capturing enterprise profiles in the agri SME arena what are some key takeaways from from that experience from your perspective um what has been you've also done a lot of convening um kind of offline online to complement you know what's going on in the platform that you have set up we'd love to hear your perspectives and uh the journey so far yes sure and um nice to meet you all and thank you thank you for having me here today audrey um, I think, I mean, I think some of the points that Anita made really lead in very nicely to, to, to what I'm going to speak about, um, particularly around, um, you spoke about how enterprises that, that have mentorship are, are better placed to access finance. And we've really come at it from the other angle, which is looking at the finance question and then uh, recognizing the importance of other forms of support, including mentorship and business support um enterprise supports um and help with business development plans and things so it, it's kind of nice to see how how coming from completely different angles we've we've kind of got to the the same point on that um perhaps as an introduction i can say a bit more about the world business council for sustainable development and and why we're working in this space and then and then give a, a, a kind of concrete example of of how we've uh, use this platform to help convene a, a discussion around uh, financing for, for agri SME specifically. Um, so the World Business Council for Sustainable Development is a CEO led business membership organization. Um, we work with 200 of the world's largest companies um, on kind of collective action on sustainability challenges. And, and that's across a range of different topics from circular economy, uh, mobility, built environments. But the team that I'm, that I'm in is focused on uh, food systems transformation. So, so working particularly with the, the large agri companies. Um, we have been looking over the last few years at the role that large companies can play in contributing to, to addressing inequality challenges. And one of one of the kind of key things that's come out of, of a couple of years worth of, of work with companies on this is the important role that large companies can play in supporting the small companies that are in their supply chains. Um, and, and really how investing in the agri SMEs that they work with can contribute to a more equitable distribution of value within their supply chains creating local jobs, um, providing mechanisms for women, youth, other marginalized groups to, to join the formal economy. Um, it's where innovation happens locally. Um, it le leads to, to lasting change. So we really honed in on, on this kind of support to agri-SMEs 
as being like a critical way that larger companies can can contribute to addressing inequality within within food and agriculture supply chains um, and so so looking at like how we take that forward and um, we decided to build an agri sme investment platform uh working closely with uh, with audrey and artha impact and um, that would enable us to overcome one of the challenges of uh, providing finance and investment for the agri SMEs so that, that our member companies are working with by providing them with greater visibility. So it was really overcoming this, this kind of visibility hurdle um, of, of profiling the SMEs um, and, and providing a way for investors to identify uh, where, the, where the deals were and where, where they could really get involved. So over the last couple of years, we've built up this Agri SME matchmaking platform and have currently um, 250 ish organizations on the platform and have got, I think it's 13 or 15 deals have been posted on the, on the platform. So we're really kind of building that community. Um, and we've done that through a series of kind of bespoke trainings focusing on on different different groups of SMEs. So either kind of with a regional focus or, or those that have been identified by some of our member companies as, as the SMEs that they work with that are looking for further finance. Um, but I think what, what, what we've come to recently is recognizing that um, we can, it, we need to complement this kind of online presence with a much more holistic approach to building the community. So we've we've started a um, kind of deep dive process and held our first deep dive at the end of last year, focusing on one specific supply chain, which was the Shea supply chain in West Africa. And the idea here really is to use the online digital platform as the kind of centerpiece of a wider dialogue that includes a lot of kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship building, um, addressing some of the wider challenges, um, going beyond just pure the pure financing angle, which is where we started, to bringing in some of the other key partners, like the enterprise support partners, the mentors, and and uh, like the whole of the SME support ecosystem. Um, so we decided to focus on Shea specifically because we were looking at ways to get more finance into the Great Green Wall region in Africa, in West Africa, and saw this as a, a way that a, a commodity that both had potential to grow on global markets. Um, it's used in uh, beauty products and food products, and we saw a kind of a, a, a commercial reason that would resonate with our main stakeholder groups of our members but also the shade trees can contribute to building restoring degraded land and as it's largely women that collect shea nuts there's a large kind of gender empowerment dimension to the commodity as well so so we did this deep dive on shea because it really hit all of these boxes and we approached this with a five-step process the first was building momentum around shea so we published a briefing document that, that we circulated widely in a way to bring investors and, and other interested parties on board, build up interest. Um, the second was about lifting visibility of the SMEs themselves. So we provided trainings to um, a whole series of uh, SMEs in Shea um, on like developing their profiles on the platform and help them to, to like present their businesses um, in a way that was likely to attract to some of the partners. Um, we then convened the whole ecosystem. So we, we held a dialogue that included a whole range of SMEs um, identified with the, with, in partnership with the Global Shea Alliance, but also enterprise support organizations. So we had people like Partnerships for Forests involved and then a, a number of impact investors as well. So we had this, this, this dialogue really had, was a chance to explore the, the specifics of, of challenges and opportunities in the sector. Um, we then continued to curate that ecosystem by doing one-on-one uh, -on -one matchmaking. Um, so a kind of much more personal approach, complementing the digital platform um, to you know, send email introductions between an investor and an SME saying, we think this would be a valuable connection. Why don't you guys get a coffee? Um, 
and then and then the final piece was about developing and sharing knowledge so we wrote up this whole process as a as a kind of investment brief in the Shea sector um but the, the takeaway really was like we felt this we needed this five-step process to really engage and build up the community um but the the platform itself was the central part that enabled us to do that um so yeah yeah we've um found yeah the top the technology has really has 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 really let us have that conversation in in a way that um we we otherwise would have would have struggled to bring the right people around the table um so yeah we're looking forward to our next deep dive which is going to be on women-led enterprises in indonesia and and certainly keen okay. to connect with organizations that would be interested to work with us either in that deep dive or or on the on the platform more broadly. Thank you so much, Victoria. That was so practical and so just hands-on. And obviously I would encourage everyone on the back of all of these various interventions to get in touch with each other on the on the back of the session to uh, to continue if there are folks you know who, who should be engaged in respective projects. I, I'd like to turn over now to our colleague, uh, Kwan Kim, Korea Country Representative at the Asia Foundation for reasons related to the confidentiality of the content that Quang will share, I'm going to pause the recording and then resume it again uh, when Quang is complete. So um, here we go. There we go. Um, Ajeta, we are thrilled to have you with us. Uh, you have founded Frontier Markets and you have been through the entire gamut and range of the journey and the emotions and the, I guess, the, the incredible amount of work you've had to do to be discovered and diligenced and acted upon by impact investors in the Indian eco ecosystem, um, including Artha Impact. Could you share a little bit about your perspective on this question? Uh, thank you. Thanks, um, Audrey, and hello, everyone, and great to see some familiar faces, I realize. It's been a while. Um, so just really quickly, um, I started Frontier Markets, um, which is a company based out of India uh, in 2011. So it's been 11 years um, of really trying to develop a solution that bridges um, basically access to products and services to rural customers in deep rural villages of India. Um, and we've uh, you know, had our own journey to go from being an energy access company to becoming a tech platform, to becoming a gender inclusive social commerce platform, where now we've been connecting over 12,500 women entrepreneurs to um, all different kinds of products and services that they're selling on the online platform to rural customers um, across three states in India, 4,000 um, villages and helping over a million customers get access to solutions at scale. Um, and what's been exciting is that, you know, we've crossed our $40 million of business as a company. We've been profitable for the last five years. Um, and we have had a very interesting experience in our fundraising story uh, because it's been a very, uh, it's been a combination of blended capital, but to cross $40 million and be profitable in five years, you would think I've raised like $100 million and I have not. It's only been about 10. And, and it's been interesting to kind of go through that process because I think that in early stages uh, in 2011, there were really zero ecosystem players that were really helping in creating those accelerators or having those platforms really come together for entrepreneurs like myself to be seen or understood um, or let alone connect with the ecosystem of what kind of impact investors would be available. We early on, of course, started getting great offline opportunities by working through platforms like VOC, like SOCAP, um, and others, where it was really, um, you know, convening physically and meeting um, and meeting organizations in person. Hopefully, getting an opportunity to be on a panel so you are heard, seen, or, or understood, and then finally trying to create networks. It was very painful because ultimately, um, it was also a reality of. Um, having to individually connect with different investors, individually explain the work that you're trying to do. And then imagine if all of them equally wanted to bring very little capital and spend over 10 months doing due diligence on you, you really weren't spending time uh, building your business, right? Um, as a true founder CEO is supposed to. And so um, really frustrating on, on every level, 
right? Because ultimately investors weren't talking to each other either when it was coming to due diligence. Um, and imagine having to negotiate 10 different term sheets or five different ways of looking at an agreement, right? And so um, there's a fatigue, uh, a reality of a fatigue that most social entrepreneurs have faced over the last 10 to 11 years in terms of their process of having to fundraise. Um, what was really, um, I think, exciting for me is obviously when I met Audrey, complained about this with even you, Topher, a lot <laughs> over the course of 11 years. Um, and I think that uh, platforms like Artha and platforms like others that finally came in with this perception that maybe we can actually work together and collaborate on deals. We can actually start looking at deal flows um, with a, a collective lens where investors would actually share due diligence right? Um, look at term sheets together. So as an entrepreneur, I would not have to deal with 20 people. I would deal with one lead, but then all the others would actually align. And that was really nicely done through a technology system, which I think was great and it's evolving. Um, I think that um, we've also seen other platforms. I mean, the one that I've been on the most recently as an unreasonable fellow um, is Flow, which again is a very unique technology platform that is meant for um, unreasonable fellows to be able to put in certain data, but then get access to insights on other investors and foundations. And then you can actually link through online to mentors who will be willing to connect that are within community. Everything is being done through a digital platform, which is great. But I think the challenges that we're still seeing is that a lot of times um, because of COVID, because of LP changes, because of fund management changes, because of new trends popping up, Ultimately, um, what is available as data for an entrepreneur is equally as outdated as what is available for an investor to know about a company, right? And I think that that's really a big challenge that we've been seeing across. Um, and so yet again, you find you know, entrepreneurs like myself having to come back to the world of networking panels to, to just catch up with people because things do change, right? I mean, we've gone from being a, a gender um, distribution company to now literally no one knows that we've been selling agri services, financial services, digital payments, and across um, uh, the networks the way that we have. And so now when you're going into scale, um, a digital commerce solution in rural India um, to reach over 100,000 women entrepreneurs, you're again trying to understand how do you go about meeting the right investors that are ready to give you not $100,000, but 10 to 15 to 20 million dollars, right? And, 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 and unfortunately, um, we still are trying to see how we can empower platforms like Artha more to bring in bigger investors, bring in bigger capital, and also be able to start thinking about the role that blended capital can play. So um, I think that ideally what we, are, we're trying, we hope to see happen more often is that there's an ability for entrepreneurs to be able to update or upgrade their information in such a way where we then don't have to make the effort for an entire ecosystem to find out what's going on. Um, but at the same time, ideally, we as entrepreneurs are getting access to more curtailed, customized uh, directories that are giving us access to the right kind of um, investors so that we're also not wasting our time trying to go through a list of like 1500 investors that all are looking at SDGs, but then we have no idea where they fit in terms of region, size, kind of capital, focus in terms of verticals that essentially allows us to then you know, really target what we're trying to do at a different level. So um, yeah, that's my uh, perspective uh, on that. Thank you uh, so much, Ajita. I mean, you're you're talking about the nuts and bolts and the actual the actual mechanics of trying to to navigate. Uh, and I, I know it's um, it's a very difficult and frustrating uh, journey at times for many entrepreneurs. And and um, and you are you know you have you have met thousands of people and 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 been able to do it. But there's there's a whole world of, of this spectrum of entrepreneurship that you know, needs to take workshops for with you <laughs> to, to be able to navigate. And it's hard and to also, scale that. I also just throw something out to the entire group around like the role that technology is now playing for businesses like ours, right? Like, I mean, as you rightfully said, post COVID, it's impossible to not be a tech play as a business. Right. And everyone keeps talking about data for impact, data for good, and really wanting to get to understand what's happening in the ecosystem, especially as donors are trying to really go deeper in terms of looking at impact metrics that are more relative to outcomes-based results. Hopefully entrepreneurs can actually start linking to some of these platforms with their own backend 
data yeah. that enables an opportunity to actually uh, do a deeper assessment on what's happening on the ground, but then also incentivizing entrepreneurs to be more data driven um, in a way that allows more capital to come in faster. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much, Jeta, for sharing. Uh, we have we're gonna we're gonna we decided we would run over a little bit on the hour. Uh, we, we I welcome questions, comments. It would be great to hear from you all in kind of a what, what's going to be probably a 10 minute window uh, for some Q&A and I would encourage people to drop their links in the chat and so the follow ups can happen um, from here. Um, any anyone have any uh, comments or questions if you do please kind of signal and please turn your video on and introduce yourself. Anyone at all. Very quiet crowd. <laughs> um, at, as ideas may, may crop up, pop up, we can continue this conversation um, uh, via, I think LinkedIn is a, is a great way to, to be able to connect with one another. Um, those who are curious about the experience of, you know, finding the right platforms, uh, we also did do a, a relatively large study for the Bertelsmann Foundation about three years ago. Uh, the link for which I will drop into the chat is a little bit dated, but it gives a little bit of an overview of the core questions, the key drivers, um, and a little bit of the, the landscape of active platforms um, for those who are interested. Uh, and yes, uh, thank you. I see people dropping, dropping points into the chat. We still have a few minutes, so. Thank you, okay. Here's a link to our study um, that may be helpful. Oh yes, Lewis. Uh, Lewis, you're muted, okay. Yep, thanks. Um, so I'm wondering, is, is the underlying problem here the, the lack of platforms or is it that the potential sources of funding in the sense that um, there seems to be a gap between the impact investors who say they want to support things, but most of whom really aren't going to take a lot of risks on early stage uh, ventures and high risk ventures. And then the philanthropists who are willing to, to give grants, but don't really understand that there is this sort of gray area between grants and things that need some sort of capital that, um, where, they're, where, where they could be providing impact investments, even if they're very high risk. So, so I'm wondering if, if, if it's the lack of platforms or if it's really the lack of um, appropriate investors um, who, who understand the market and are willing to, to take the right risks. Thank you, Lewis. Um, I, I can chime in with a four second reply, but I'd like to hear from others. I don't think there's a shortage of platforms. There are hundreds of platforms. Uh, the issue, however, is the fact that they're all islands and that the um, kind of the incentive structure to have interoperability across systems is not really there yet. It's one of the reasons why we, we decided with our technology to go into kind of a SaaS model where the infrastructure would be consistent for all underlying users um, in terms of underlying data. Um, I do think, though, there's also difficult there's difficulty on the investment investor side, and you know this is an old this is an old adage which I'd love to see challenged, but here it is: not many people want to fund the ecosystem. Everybody wants to fund their own portfolio or you know pursue their direct interests, whatever they may be, but not many people willing to invest in the infrastructure. Uh, that's going to grease the wheels, enable greater collaboration, especially on due diligence, which is can be a huge time waster for the entrepreneurs. If it's done at 10 months at a pop and, 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 and takes you know a year and a half to execute a transaction thereon. Other comments, thoughts? I'm just gonna add, uh, just because I think Luis, your question is interesting because it's, it's actually also about matching the right time. Right, because um, I think that, um, and that's a really interesting point because um, you know, ideally, even for us, and it's I don't think it's just early stage, right? It's even also looking at 
uh, when you're looking at growth stage businesses in the sectors of SDGs, there's always going to be a high cost for growth up front. And then, of course, it de-risks over a period of time. And there's a struggle of finding the match de-risk capital to the, to the scale capital. Um, in, in a way that is that, that platforms aren't helping. And, and so what Audrey Singh is correct that there's hundreds of these platforms, but we're not being able to find the right people at the right time to actually link that story um, at all, which I think is an interesting point that you're making. And then I would second the point that no one's funding coalitions. Like during COVID as a response, um, there were 12 access companies in rural India that were ready to come together in common governance to respond to COVID in the right way and be able to collectively bring capital from platforms like the World Economic Forum. And all we could do was get funding for project implementation, but no one was willing to fund the actual gathering of the coalition and the governance that needs to come to actually put 12 organizations in the right direction, right? And so, cause that, that funding is fundamentally not leading to quote unquote impact numbers, but it is, in our perspective, of course, strengthening the ability to create that system change scale, but that money is not there. Thanks, Ajeta. Other uh, thoughts, responses, questions? We can maybe do one more, or uh, we will uh, close shortly as I realize there will be other Catalyst uh, sessions, CCW sessions beginning now. Well, um, this has been uh, an incredibly exciting and enlightening session. We've had such great perspectives offered by all of our speakers. I'm so grateful to all of you for being here, for listening. Um, Anita, Tofer, Kwang, Victoria, Ajeta, uh, this has been amazing. So really, really grateful. Again, I encourage you to do some follow-ups if you see names on our list here where you can have deeper conversations, you know, brainstorms, et cetera. This is the, this is the whole goal of everything that, you know, Catalyst 2030 stands for. Um, yeah, um, in terms of next steps, uh, let, 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 us, let us exchange on LinkedIn. I'd like to thank in particular, uh, Manoj Panjwani and Deepa Merchandani for helping us to pull this together. Uh, this was wonderful. And um, I do, I have been told I have a, Lovely slide to share um, as part of the formal goodbye. Here we go. There we go. Here we go. Any take home messages, anything that you've taken away with you on the back of the conversation, you know, feel, feel free to share it on Twitter, use the hashtags and handles, those from our session, etc. cetera. And um, yeah, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Wishing everyone a good rest of the afternoon or evening or day. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone.